In the United States of America, some of the world's most notorious criminals are locked behind bars. One of those is James Robertson. He was sent to prison for violent crimes at an early age. He wasn't 17 yet. He commits serious offenses, aggravated batteries, assaults on law enforcement officers. He is a criminal who has refused to comply. He escaped with his co-defendant, and they were caught. And now he faced another case, another charge, and he got two more years consecutive. He met criteria for psychopathy. That means that engaging in criminal activity, he had very little remorse and very little empathy for all of those acts he engaged in. Now behind bars, Robertson has targeted those working in the jail. I was stabbed in the center of the chest, and then he stabbed me one more time uh, in the stomach. They are people that would kill you as soon as you opened your mouth if you said something wrong. You have to be trained for, and if you're not, you're gonna end up dead. He is one of the most feared men in the U.S. prison system. He's going to be in danger with anyone he comes into contact with because he's so focused on serving his own needs that it really doesn't matter who is in his way. He actually confronted his cellmate and said to him, I'm going to give you a choice. I can tie you up and torture you, or I can kill you. Locked away for life, he has nothing to lose. He started at a young age, and it just went from bad to worse. Anybody can be collateral damage, and that's what makes him one of the most dangerous prisoners. He had choked him with dental floss, and then he finished with a saw. He's sitting there with a corpse. He's eating breakfast, and he's just sitting there. Charlotte Correctional Institute is a state prison in Florida, United States. Charlotte Correctional was a very, very difficult, tough prison. The environment for me working there was the closest thing to being in hell. The smell, the inmates constantly masturbated. They were shouting, they were banging, they were flooding their cells. It was very, very difficult. On one floor of the prison are a group of prisoners so dangerous they are under watch 24-7. These aren't just inmates who have assaulted, murdered, and raped in the community. These are inmates that continue to assault and rape and murder while they're in prison. So they require a high level of security, a high level of monitoring. James Robertson is one of them. Robertson is probably one of the most dangerous inmates in the United States prison system. He's going to be a danger to inmates. He's going to be a danger to staff. He's going to be a danger to correction officers. December 19th, 2011, when I came to work and my life kind of changed forever. During my shift, I was walking my rounds. James Robertson was in his cell and asked me to take the trash out for him. I made a mistake and opened his cell door and was actually attacked and stabbed by James. He was incarcerated, I believe, at the age of 16. Initially, they were nonviolent crimes, but he quickly escalated to violence. He commits serious offenses, burglary of structure, aggravated assault, and a law enforcement officer with aggravated battery. He was originally sentenced to 10 years in prison. But once he was incarcerated, he decided that he wanted to go to death row. And so he decided to murder his cellmate in order to get the death penalty. My name is Ann Otwell, and I've been at Charlotte Correctional as a forensic mental health nurse for 30 years. When I first met James, he was angry had been in prison for many years, many years. He had a rap sheet that was unbelievable. While he was in the prison, he committed some pretty bad crimes. First degree attempted murder, aggravated battery. He never stopped. Consecutive sentence after consecutive sentence. 
no stop, and then plotting out a murder, because that's what he did. He was probably able to engage in assaults and murder with little to no feeling of any kind of empathy or remorse around that. Anyone who could commit the crimes he did and not be phased and continue to commit these crimes, what does he have to lose? Before James Robertson was first in prison, he had lived in Florida his whole life. James Robertson was born in Orlando, Florida, May 26, 1963. The family ties were not good. It was not what you'd call a Brady Bunch family. My name is Mike Gottfried. I was an officer for the Department of Corrections for a period of 23 years. James Robertson told me that his father beat him. He told me his father was an alcoholic. He told me his mother was an alcoholic. He told me his brothers had been in the prison system. Robertson had a very tumultuous childhood. He also had a history of abuse. His father used to beat him physically. In addition, he came from a very low socioeconomic background. He had a lot of poverty, and he was not placed in the best schools. He also started engaging in drug use at a very early age. These are all risk factors for James Robertson to go on and engage in criminal activity at a very early age, which is exactly what he did. On February 25th of 1975, he commits shoplifting. Not a real serious crime. Kids do that all the time. He had started his crimes at 12 years old, and it just went from bad to worse. Robertson was hardly ever at school. Instead, he chose to spend his time hanging out in his neighborhood, robbing anyone and anything. He had so far managed to avoid a custodial sentence. It's like you're skating on ice, but it's starting to splinter. The fact that he does one thing in January and another thing in February sends me the message that he doesn't care. Where is anybody to sit him down? Where is a juvenile counselor? to sit him down and, and speak to him and, and tell him this is not gonna end well. The brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 24. Some of these juveniles tend to act out, which ultimately ends up having early contact with law enforcement, getting arrested at an early age, and it just becomes a pattern ending up in correctional facilities as opposed to getting the help they require. In 1978, when Robertson was just 14 years old, a violent attack on three youths saw him back in court. This was a juvenile case in Orange County. It was three counts of aggravated battery. That's serious because you have victim injury. One of the youths had a cut and abrasions on his neck. One was hit in the chest and one was hit under the right eye and the top of the right foot and right leg. He's found guilty of two counts. He was committed to youth services for an indeterminate sentence. Less than a year later, Robertson was kicked out of the school, and it was not long before he was back in trouble with the law. He wasn't 17 yet. He would be 17 in a couple of weeks, May 26. He commits serious offenses, burglary of structure. He went in to steal something. The cops came, he threatened the officers. He committed aggravated assault, two counts. Don't forget, he, he burglarized a building, so we don't know what he had in his hand. And he said, you come near me, and I'm going to do so-and-so. Well, you just jumped it up to aggravated. Now you have a third-degree felony. Those are serious crimes. Robertson was seen as a volatile and dangerous individual. He was securely locked away in an adult institution for the first time. And he was sentenced each count, four years, state prison. Normally, it's concurrent. This judge made it consecutive. So now he's got eight years. You don't go to prison right away. So he was sent to the county jail. The county jails are for, you know, pretrial to detainees um, or people who have a sentence of less than a year. People usually think that a county jail is where, you know, that's smaller crimes and things like that, but we actually have a wide array of inmates there. 
very wide spectrum, including people who are on death row or doing life sentences. He's in the county jail. You think he would learn? No, no, not him. After being behind bars for just three months, Robertson had had enough and plotted an escape. He escaped with his co-defendant, and they were caught. And now he faced another case, another charge, and he got two more years consecutive. Now he's looking at 10 years. All of his arrest record, and I'm seeing absolutely no remorse. Robertson was transferred to a maximum security state prison. You can't compare a maximum security prison to a county jail. There's just no comparison. He's a 17-year-old. Now he's going to a state prison. And he's a newbie. He's never been in a state institution. And there are some really bad guys in state prison. Most people that age would really be afraid. What's interesting about Mr. Robinson is that after he was arrested and initially sentenced to 10 years in prison, now 10 years is a long time, but it's not a life sentence, he continued to engage in really egregious criminal activity in prison, including stabbing and riots. Prisons obviously are a dangerous place to work because they house people who have engaged in violent crimes and things like rape and murder and assault and batteries. For new inmates coming in, it's a different world. We had a lot of older inmates who preyed on the younger inmates. It's a difficult situation to be in, especially if you're brand new to the correctional facilities. One of the first inmates 17-year-old James Robertson encountered was Efren Yero. His words here are voiced by an actor. I was on the exercise yard working out when a Mexican friend of mine walked up to me with a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed white kid and said, Hey, Chan, look at this little white boy. He just got off the bus. Well, when I saw him, I laughed, walked up to him and said, You're cute and I pinched his face. Well, no sooner than I touched his face, this scrawny little runt, scarcely weighing 126 pounds, soaking wet, hauled off and swung on me, hitting me in the face. Robertson had quickly learned how to stay alive. And a lot of them will look for protection from other inmates. There are gangs in the prison system, whether it's a black gang, Hispanic gang, skinheads, you know, the supremacists or stuff like that. So it's what direction are you going to turn? Who is going to help you and at what cost? There's always a price. Couldn't believe this little run swung on me. Before I knew it, he ran for a curl bar that was lying on the ground in the weight pile, grabbed it, and he was cocking it back to swing it at me. I moved in and took him down. I quickly began to apologize, saying, OK, OK, Shorty, I'm sorry. I'm gonna let you get up now. I don't want any more trouble from you. He looked at me, just repeated, don't try me, don't try me, over and over. And then, never did again. That was how I met James Robertson, AKA Chickenhead, way back in 1981. He was 17 years old then. Demographically, most of the young white guys who thought they were real tough on the outside, they come to a state prison and, you know, what am I doing here? I'm afraid. There's officers there. They do checks and stuff like that, but things happen. You can't prevent everything. You always have inmates who are willing to engage in violence and illegal activities even after they are incarcerated. He seemed to be on a course to prove himself. If James Robertson had kept his head down, he could have walked free from prison before he turned 30. But that just wasn't going to happen. At the age of 17, James Robertson, also known as Chickenhead, was sent to state prison after being convicted of burglary, aggravated assault, and attempted escape. He was sentenced to 10 years behind bars. So I don't know if he would have gotten paroled. Or, I, I really don't know. But he would have been done. Only 27 years old. 
James Robertson had initially got protection from an older prisoner, Efren Yero. I told the predators who were stalking him, wanting to rape him, that he was no punk and wasn't going to be a punk, and that I was enforcing that. Unfortunately, I ended up getting into a fight and was transferred. After I left, Chickenhead got into some with somebody who tried him and transferred to Cross City Correctional Institution. This was the beginning of the end for Robertson. He was transferred from facility to facility. If he committed a crime in there, if there was fighting, if there was an assault, then they'll ship him out to another prison. And in his case, he went back and forth a lot. He was bouncing around like a rubber ball from one institution to another, and nothing slowed him down. Everywhere Robertson went, trouble was not far behind. From 1985, these crimes that were committed, transmitting contraband in a state facility, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, introducing a weapon into a state facility, escape, battery on a law enforcement officer, constructive possession of a weapon. I've come across a multitude of weapons, stabbing devices, slashing devices, batteries, and rocks inside of a sock so they swing it around and hit you on the head with it. When they really want to kill somebody and they're really desperate and they don't have access to making weapons, what they will do is they will cut out a piece of their cell, their locker. They'll get a needle because the needle's made out of titanium and they will trace over and over and over again till they punch it out. And when they punch out that piece of uh, metal, they sharpen it. And that's how they make what's known as a bone crusher. And they call it a bone crusher because it's deep enough to penetrate the bones. Every time Robertson got into trouble, more years were added to his sentence. He got caught up in some situations at different prisons where they said he had done, he had stabbed someone, he caught more time trying to escape, more time. When they took him from the jail to the courthouse, I believe he took the officer's gun and was gonna shoot him. He caught more time, he ended up life. Everything is running consecutive. I have to quickly envision this in my mind is how many years this kid is looking at and nothing stops him. It seems like criminal activity became a norm for him. Most inmates go to prison and they just do their time and go home. But you have your exceptions. And typically the common denominator would be that they have antisocial personality disorder and or they're psychopaths, especially if they are the world's most dangerous criminals. As Robertson's violence escalated, so did the punishments. He's a threat to officers. They can't control him. Look, look what he's doing. He's a threat to inmates because he's fighting with them. And basically, he's a threat to himself because sooner or later, he's going to get his. When inmates start to fight, officers have to break it up. It's not always an easy task. And you can get hurt. Then he's going to be reviewed for close management because he is a danger. In 1988, James Robertson was sent to close management also known as CM. Close management inmates they are on 23-hour lockdown with one hour of recreation in a secured perimeter area, also surrounded by razor wire. The inmates were fed through a food slot. You might have inmates in there that have committed aggravated battery on law enforcement officers, assaults on law enforcement officers, rape, all, all kinds but they can't walk the compound because of the danger they possess to other inmates or officers. So basically, it is confinement for 23 hours in a six by eight cell. The only saving grace, I guess, for them is the fact that they're not sharing that cell with another inmate. 
There is no television, there are typically no books, there are typically nothing to occupy their time. And so that gives inmates a lot of time to engage in maladaptive behaviors and more criminal activity, such as using drugs, such as fighting, such as plotting, such as trying to manipulate. So he was probably fueled by anger, probably decided that he was not going to ever do the right thing and just figured it was the perfect environment for him to carry on with his psychopathic and criminal tendencies. Once released from close management, Robertson was usually sent back after breaking more rules. This continued for the next 18 years. In 2006, he was sent to Charlotte Correctional Institution. I worked at Charlotte Correctional Institution until 2021. Charlotte Correctional was a maximum security prison. Although Charlotte was one of the cleanest prisons that I had been at, the heat was unbearable and the inmates got showered three times a week. So you can imagine walking into a quad, the stench would just hit you, it was like being in a sewer. At the time he went to Charlotte County in 2006, he was already at that time 43, and he was looking at years more of custody. If you add up all these years consecutively, I'd have to get a calculator out. As soon as he arrived, Robertson was put into close management again. The noise was constantly yelling, banging, hollering at each other, foul words. Most of the noise from CM was at night. They were up all night long, banging, yelling all night long. So during the day it was noisy, but at night it was even worse. The years of close management had taken a toll on James Robertson. We have a lot of mental health in the prison system. If you aren't having problems when you go in the system, you will have problems. If you've got a long, drawn out sentence, you will. Robertson also had a drug problem. When somebody is addicted to substances, they are more likely to engage in high-risk behaviors as a direct result of those substances, as well as in attempt to get money for those substances. Being a forensic mental health nurse is taking care of inmates who are on psychotropic drugs. A nurse that takes care of the mentally insane and mentally challenged people in the prison system. James Robertson was one of my patients. His anger was just unbelievable. He was a big man to begin with. He had his passive aggressive behavior with us. He had been on every drug, crack, LSD, cocaine, marijuana, K2. He had been on everything in his life in the system. Everything, you name it, he was on it. Having been in the highest level of close management for many years, James Robertson was eventually moved to a lower level known as CM3. CM3, they have a cellmate. It's a gradual increase of freedom, so to speak, from lockdown 23-7. Between all the offenses that he committed in the prison, the fact that he was in CM3 was kind of a miracle because it's a gradual step towards release uh, to the compound with general population. But even if it's CM3, you are still confined. This is a guy who spent maybe 20 years in close management custody, and you reach a breaking point. It was too much for Robertson. He made his ultimate wish clear to anyone that asked. James always told me, I hate it here, I'm gonna be on the row because you people treat me like a dog, like an animal. I hate close management. I wanna be on the row and it's quiet. I don't wanna go open population and I'm sick of close management. So that was his ultimate goal was to be on death row. I think Robertson wanted to die and maybe I'm wrong, but when he said, I want to make a statement, I want them to take me seriously, maybe in the back of his mind, the death penalty, now they're going to take me seriously. I did it. 
and I died. But personally, if he really wanted to die, he could have killed himself. I think he was a coward. While in CM3, James Robertson met his new cellmate, 52-year-old Frank Hart. Frank Hart was a sex offender, and I believe he was close to being released. He really didn't like Frank Hart. I don't think he liked the idea that he was a sex offender. There's a code in prison. They hate pedophiles. And he told them, do not put a pedophile in my cell. And unfortunately, Frank Hart was a pedophile. And when they put him in James's cell, he realized that this was his way out. He was going to kill him. On December 10th, 2008, James Robertson decided it was the moment to act on his plan. They were alone in his cell. He's been in close management enough to know the routine of cell checks. The breakfast comes, and it goes through the food slot. James Robertson ate his breakfast and Hart's breakfast. An officer came in to do the cell check, just to make sure everything is OK. And of course, things were not OK. I got a call from one of the nurses that was passing meds. And James had given her a note and said, don't bother to give Frank Hart his medicine. I killed him yesterday. James Robertson had strangled his cellmate, Frank Hart, to death the night before. James Robertson took socks and he tied them together. He did the deed. He strangled inmate Hart. After being moved to a less strict level of close management, James Robertson had attacked and killed his cellmate at the first opportunity. When we got Frank Hart up to the medical department in our emergency room, I saw the dental floss around his neck. And he had first choked him with the dental floss. And then he finished with a sock. And that was the day before. This was not a quick and easy murder. This was something that was torturous. Robertson later on stated that he had murdered Mr. Hart because he was a sex offender, which we all know sex offenders tend to be low on the totem pole in correctional facilities. However, I'm not convinced that that's really the reason Mr. Robertson murdered Mr. Hart. What I believe is that he was a convenient target. But at the end of the day, Mr. Robertson was going to murder whoever was going to be the most convenient for him to get sent to death row. James Robertson was now facing a murder conviction. I personally never had an inmate tell me they wished they were on death row, like in the case of James Robertson. But I have had inmates tell me that they wouldn't mind killing their cellmate to have single cell status, which means being alone in their cell. I always knew that he wanted to be on death row. I just never knew what he was going to do or when it was going to happen. But it didn't surprise me with him, especially with James, because he was adamant. It was funny because the next day, we were transferring Frank Hart to another prison. But I don't believe that James knew that. Usually, the inmates know everything. They know it before we know it. Robertson was charged with murder and sent to Charlotte County Jail to await sentencing. My name is Barry Amoli, and I am a former corrections deputy with the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department. Basically, you know, uh, care, custody, and control of inmates. I would go in there. We were a uh, direct supervision facility, which means we were directly in with the inmate population. Barry Amoli was working at Charlotte County Jail in October 2009, when James Robertson was transferred there for hearings on his murder charge. Robertson was back in the highest level of close management, CM1. James Robertson was at an elevated custody level with us. 
not somebody who could be around other inmates or put in general population. Um, he was known to be a violent offender. He was CM1 close management. A completely different set of rules than the open population inmates in the regular pods. Uh, the inmates in his particular uh, area, most of them were looking at a long prison sentence. They got their hour of recreation several times a week. They got their showers, but they were confined. Barry Amoli knew James Robertson from the various periods he had been incarcerated at the jail. James Robertson was an individual among a bunch of characters, and he was different. He was an institutionalized person who'd been in prison for a very long time. He didn't want problems that he didn't need. He didn't create a lot of issues. He was quiet, though he's very respectful to me. James Robertson was charged with second degree murder, but fired various defense lawyers because he wanted to be charged with first degree murder and be sent to death row. He had about seven attorneys, I think, I, I lost count. He wanted to be put to death because he's had enough of this life behind the door for all these years, and he's just tired of it. Most inmates do not want to go to death row. They don't want to be put to death. However, there is this rumor around prisons that death row is very cushy. He wanted to go to death row because he, he wanted to get away from everybody. And death row is quieter, death row is smaller. He doesn't have to deal with all the things that are going on in close management. Ultimately, he just wanted to be out of this life. Well, James, it always seemed to me that he had something in mind. I really do feel like he had a very dangerous thought process that was constantly going in his mind. He was always analyzing, he was always looking, he was quiet, and you know, the quiet ones are sometimes the most dangerous, so. He wasn't the biggest, strongest, wasn't the one who was gonna kick the door off the hinges and come get you, but you make a mistake and he'll figure a way and, and he's gonna accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Robertson was still searching for an opportunity to escalate his sentence. So this is why I walked into the facility December 19th, 2011, and began my shift. I worked the maximum segregation unit, which was where James Robertson was housed. They are people that would kill you as soon as you opened your mouth if you said something wrong, if they weren't behind the gate. It's not something that you want to be exposed to. It's something that you have to be trained for, and if you're not, you're going to end up dead. James knocked on his door and asked me to empty his garbage. When he asked me to do that, typically we take the garbage through the food flap, um, but he started spilling everywhere and making a mess, so I just, without thinking, put my key in and opened his door so he wouldn't make a mess. As soon as I put the key in and opened the door, James rushed the door, attempted to push it open. I tried to stop him from coming out of the cell, but it was too late. He was already too far out, so at that point, the fight was on. James had fashioned two long pieces of metal that were pointy. He had sharpened them. He had used a T-shirt to fashion handles on them and then bladed wrist straps so that they were attached to him and they were coming through his hands, kind of like Wolverine. He stabbed me in the arm the first time as he was trying to get out the door. It was on at that point. I knew I wasn't going to be able to force him back into the cell by pushing the door, and uh, I was going to have to let him out and face him face to face. He asked me for my keys, which I told him no, and clipped them into my belt. I was giving him verbal commands like we're trained to do, stop, what are you doing, you know, what is this? I knew that he wasn't going to stop, so as soon as he went for another punch, I was able to punch him a couple of times. I think it made him a little dizzy. I think I hit him good enough that it took the wind out of his sails and he kind of just slumped. And then right at that time, the officer that I was working with, she came to the door and she opened the door. And so I kind of switched gears. It's like, well, I do not want her in here involved. This guy has two knives attached to his hand. So I ran to the door. I pushed her out the door. We secured the door back down. It wasn't until after when I could see that I was bleeding out of the two places where I had been stabbed. Barry Amoli was taken to hospital and treated for his injuries, which luckily were not life-threatening. 
I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't shocked. And that's part of the complacency that is so dangerous in this business. But the training that I had done here and that I was given with the sheriff's department, it came into play and it saved my life. An investigation into the incident clarified Robertson's intentions. I made up my mind before I even opened up the door. I made up my mind if he tries to bark. I'm just gonna stab him a few times, just let him know I'm serious, you know, that I want the key, you know what I mean? He didn't give me no choice. I don't wanna kill a guard. I just wanted to kill an inmate so I could go death row. James Robertson was charged with attempted second degree murder and attempted robbery with a deadly weapon. He wanted to kill another inmate that was housed several cells down from him. Uh, that inmate had been very vocal towards James and was unknown sexual predator, and James didn't really care for those type of individuals. James's plan was to steal my keys from me at all costs. If that meant killing me, it's what it was, then go down and get him in his cell and stab him to death. So you're going to continue to kill inmates until you get to on death, death roll. That's right. You know, okay. and I meant what I said. James Robertson had been on a mission to be sent to death row. Now he had killed a fellow inmate, he was facing new charges. I was a member of the Florida Department of Corrections for a period of 23 years. And during that time, I did the pre-sentence investigation for inmate James Robertson. Robertson was at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office jail awaiting sentencing on account of first degree murder of inmate Frank Hart. The pre-sentence investigation is basically a report submitted to the court to show the judge everything about this defendant. Without the pre-sentence investigation, all the judge knows about the defendant is what he has read on the arrest report and the prior record. The judge doesn't know anything socioeconomically. He doesn't know how he was raised, his mental health, alcohol and drug abuse, substance abuse, and these are important things. When I pulled his records, I found his behavior from the time he was 12 years old, he was ungovernable, he was intolerable. He did not seem to ever stop engaging in violence. He did not seem to ever stop engaging in rule breaking. From the time he was a juvenile, James Robertson was screaming for mental health counseling. Nothing seemed to affect him. Consecutive sentence after consecutive sentence after consecutive, he knew there was no way he's gonna see the light of day. And yet he continues. He had no childhood. He became an adult at 12. And that's not an excuse because I know a lot of people that have never had a childhood and came from a broken home. That's not an excuse, that's a choice. So that was his choice. He chose that road, he chose those cards, and he played them. I would say that Mr. Robertson is institutionalized just by the fact that he's been incarcerated essentially his whole adult life and he continued to reoffend. That being said, I don't think Mr. Robertson would have been any different out in the community. I think he would have continued to reoffend whether he was in prison or not. He seems to be a complete psychopath by the very definition of psychopathy. And so the environment really was not going to change whether or not Mr. Robertson was going to engage in criminal behaviors. He was very angry and fed up with the whole situation. <laughs> he had had about enough of this. In December 2012, Mike Gottfried interviewed James Robertson for this pre-sentence report. He was 49 years old when I interviewed him and spent 31 years in prison. I sit like I'm sitting facing you. He's, there's a table between us and he's shackled legs and hands. I mean, he's a dangerous kind of guy. It might sound strange, but he was very forthcoming. He didn't try to hide anything. He admitted to everything he did. I know he murdered his cellmate in CM3, Frank Hart. Sometimes you can look at a person. See, I like eye contact because there's signals. 
movement of the eyes, twitching. He didn't show any signs of wrongdoing. Robertson had killed Frank Hart for just one reason. He wanted to get out of close management and be put on death row. James had been in prison for most of his adult life. I think that he was upset that he didn't get the death penalty um, for you know his previous crimes, and I think he had just had enough. I have a list of all the institutions he's been in, and it was close management here, close management there, and that was the thing that was killing him. Frank Hart was not the nice guy of the world, but he had siblings, he had a family. In fact, when I spoke with his family, they wanted retribution. Family is family. Now, you can't bring the victim back, but someone has to pay a price. And here's a person who wanted to pay that price. He's facing first degree murder charges. The only thing is whether he's gonna to go to prison for the rest of his life without the possibility of parole, or whether he's gonna get the death penalty. After I completed my report, my conclusion was there is no environment and there are no resources that will ever assist this offender in rehabilitation. The recommendation was for the death penalty. My conclusion was based on willful kill or homicide that the death penalty was justice. On December 18th, 2012, James Robertson was called to Charlotte County Courthouse to discover his fate. He came in, he was shackled, hands, legs, and there was a SWAT team that brought him in. I saw him adjudicated guilty, sentenced to the death penalty, and I didn't see a look of disbelief, a look of fear. It's almost as if he knew this was coming, and it finally arrived. In February 2013, Robertson was transferred to death row at Union Correctional Institution in Florida. Mr. Robertson was the perfect storm to become somebody who was going to ultimately end up on death row. James Robertson was always very respectful to me, and I never had uh, any idea that James Robertson would attack me. It was very surprised that I was being complacent. I changed my whole life since then because of this incident. James Robertson had finally got his wish and is now on death row. But it took the death of a fellow prisoner to get him there. He never had a break, but there's a lot of people out there that never had a break. But I go back to your choices that you made. He made that choice. No one else did. James will not be put to death because there's so many others ahead of him that he will die of probably of natural causes. And he got what he wanted. Simple as that. He made the choice, he got it, and that's it. Mr. Robertson is probably one of the most dangerous inmates in the United States prison system for the simple fact that anyone can be a target. He's going to be a danger to inmates. He's going to be a danger to staff. He's going to be a danger to correction officers. He's going to be in danger with anyone he comes into contact with because he's so focused on serving his own needs that anybody can be collateral damage. Death row is not a punishment anymore. You've already been punished. You know that eventually you're going to get an execution date. You're just waiting for your date. That's your difference. It's over.